All right, let's do this. Uh, during this presentation, I think that I have only 40 minutes, but I will try to, uh, you know, save as much time as possible for the Q&A session. While you're listening to me, I'm going to kind of share some theory today. And uh, also I'm going to demonstrate uh, some interesting demos. But and throughout this presentation, just go ahead and put your questions into the chat window. And then my goal would be, you know, to keep at least 10 minutes for the Q&A. That's my, my goal. So that then we can have a conversation here. Right, let's start. Uh, and memory computing essentials for software engineers. So today, you know that uh, there is a myriad of different in memory technologies that we can use to speed up or accelerate our applications. Some of you might use caches, the others can use memory databases. And there is a huge difference between all those in memory computing technologies in regards to the feature set, in regards to some other capabilities, but there is always something that unites in uh, all of those technologies that makes all those technologies universal and i define those universal characteristics as memory computing essentials something fundamental that exists in almost all the memory computing systems and the goal of this presentation is first to introduce you to those in memory computing essentials and second of all my goal is to ensure you that you need to keep those essentials in mind when you will be building any in-memory powered applications. And then based on those essentials, you can go further and you can select either a cache or in-memory database depending on your on the required feature set. Uh, a little bit uh, about myself. My name is Denis Magda. Uh, for the last five years, I've been studying and working with distributed in-memory systems. I'm gaining practical experience by contributing to the Apache Ignite project, uh, which is a memory computing platform that is used as a cache or a database. And also I'm uh, collaborating a lot with application developers and architects who are using Ignite and other distributed systems. And uh, by working with, uh, by running developer relations group at Grid Game. At the same time, before that, I was involved in uh, Java uh, GDK development and Java virtual machine development. I spent many years working for Oracle and Sun Microsystems, and my zone of responsibilities and interest was Java for mobile devices and embedded devices. All right, so our agenda for today. Uh, first thing first, um, we'll, I need to introduce you to the kind of rationale behind the memory computing, why we need to... Uh, why 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 it's essential why we are even you know deploying those in memory computing systems second of all i will spend three or five minutes uh, um, covering apache ignite for you because apache ignite i will be using apache ignite for reference as a reference implementation i'm, I'm going to show you some applications that are using ignite uh, but nevertheless all the rest of the essentials that we are going to dive into later such as data partitioning affinity collocation or collocated computations they are not characteristics of Ignite only, but you will find out that uh, when we talk about data partition and affinity collocation, the same essential capabilities exist in other technologies that can keep data in memory, all right? So why in memory computing? So the question is quite uh, straightforward and the, and the answer is simple. That's all about speed and scale. Uh, the scale comes, comes from the horizontal scalability of distributed and memory systems. As any distributed database and in memory cache or in memory database, that can keep your data across a cluster of machines. For instance, your very first instance of your application can communicate with a cluster that has only three nodes. But then as long as your workload grows or you are about to keep much more data in your cluster, what you do, you just scale out your cluster. You are adding third node, like fourth node, fifth node, and you keep doing this as long as you know, need more machines. Uh, and where does the speed come from? So that's all about latency. That's about access time. We as software architects and engineers understand that uh, memory access is much faster than disk, but let's try to figure out what's the magnitude, how, how big is the difference between disk access and memory access. I'm usually using this uh, table to show the difference. So what you have in the first column, uh, we have some various system events that our CPUs need to process. And to the right, you have the actual latency time. So basically, how much time does it take for a CPU to complete any operation to the left? 
And in the final third column, we have scaled latencies, so-called like the latency that is adapted or translated into the our human universe. Because we as humans, we can comprehend, you know, the time uh, by measuring it in seconds, days, and years, and then we can sense the difference between seconds and minutes and dates. We cannot sense the difference, you know, like when we're talking about nanoseconds or microseconds. That's why, like, what 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 happened in this table? Uh, the author of this table assumed that if to put that four nanoseconds are equal to one second, which is equal to one CPU cycle, then the rest of the actual latencies will be translated to their uh, values in the third column. And after that, if we pay attention to the uh, latency uh, time differences between main memory access and disk access, you'll see that in our universe, in the human universe there, that latency is like the difference between minutes and days. And that's why we are, and as architects or developers, we are going ahead and deploying distributed in memory systems. That's why we are using in memory computing software because it has provides two main characteristics. First, it's scalable. And second, it, it stores all the data in memory and memory main memory access is much faster. It's like the difference between minutes and days if to compare to disk access, all right? And Apache Ignite, as I said, Apache Ignite, we are going to use it as a reference platform to you know, describe all those essentials in details. And I'm going to show you some demos that use Apache Ignite. But nevertheless, most of the stuff that we are going to cover today, you can apply this knowledge to other distributed memory systems that you are using for your projects. All right, Apache Ignite. Uh, Apache Ignite is a memory computing platform. And that's why on this slide, you can see so many building blocks uh, that comprise this project. But uh, to put uh, things simple, usually I explain Ignite uh, this way. Ignite consists of two primary components. The first one is Ignite distributed multi-tier storage. Uh, Ignite by definition can keep data in memory across a cluster of machines, but at the same time Ignite can persist your records on disk. And when it comes to disk, Ignite can persist your data in a third-party database, such as Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, or Cassandra. Or Ignite can persist all the data in its own disk tier in Ignite native persistence across, again, the cluster of machines. I, I'll show you the difference between those two uh, persistence options on the next slide. And that's like the first component in memory, like distributed multi-tier storage. And on top of that storage, the second component is a variety of APIs. Ignite natively supports SQL. You can query data with SQL. You can transact on Ignite using distributed transactions. You can, you know, uh, query data using key value APIs, and you can run computations. Today, we are going to explore some of these APIs, in particular SQL, um, Compute Grid, and uh, Key Value. And when it comes to Apache Ignite use cases, uh, I would say that there are two primary use cases. Even though I've talked to many people who use Ignite for some, you know unbelievable usage for unbelievable applications. So the very first obvious use case is Ignite as a cache. In this case, you can have, let's say, one database, probably just that keeps all your primary records. And then you have application. And right now you need to accelerate your applications or offload that database. And you deploy Ignite as a distributed in memory cache in between your application and the database. It's obvious, right? And then you kind of, right now, uh, you might be sitting and thinking like, then what's the difference between Ignite and Redis in this case? I would say that uh, you would use Ignite as a cache if you need SQL API, so if you need transactions, or if you need compute. Otherwise, you can go ahead and take Redis. But if you need SQL, if you need compute API, so if you need transactions, then uh, Ignite will be a natural choice for you for the caching use case. Uh, the other use case of Ignite is uh, the memory database. In this scenario, you can use the same APIs you would use for the caching scenario. It's no difference, it's just a deployment option. Uh, but when it comes to the persistence tier, in this case, you're not keeping data in a third party database such as Oracle or Cassandra, but instead, you are having all the data in Ignite native persistence and your cluster and kind of you're getting a cluster of machines that stores data both in memory on and disk. The difference here, like why, what, what you're getting with this deployment configuration, first thing, uh, Ignite native persistence will keep 100% of your records, which means that you don't need to cache everything in memory. And that's ideal for, let's say, hybrid use cases when you keep operational and analytical data. Operational data can fully 
uh, be located in memory, but as for the analytical data, only a subset of the data can be on, uh, in RAM. And as long as all the data is on disk, if you need to restart your Ignite cluster due to any maintenance needs, you just you know reboot it, and you don't need to wait while all your terabytes or petabytes of data get reloaded into the memory. Ignite can serve and read all the data from disk, warming up memory tier in background. And again, like that's Apache Khan conversation. I, I I do believe that many of you already know Ignite, but just in case Ignite is one of the top uh, five projects of the foundation, if to judge by the dev list and mailing list activity, and it's being used in, in this open source project is being used by many well-known companies. All right, enough for the introduction. So right now, what we uh, figure out, right now we know the uh, reasoning and rationale behind the in-memory computing uh, systems. Why do we need that? Because those provide speed and scale. And I've, 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 I have made an introduction to Ignite. So right now, let's... Uh, follow the primary course of this presentation. Let's talk about essentials. And the first one is data partitioning. This technique lets, lets us you know, to distribute our records and use all the resources of our cluster. So uh, if to compare partitioning you know, to kind of to the way how the data is stored by relational, like legacy relational databases, classical relational databases, usually all the records will be stored on a single machine. And uh, the goal of the partitioning is to take all those records and distribute them across a cluster of the nodes, as it's shown on this slide. And today I'm going to give you an example of one uh, database schema, world database. That uh, schema keeps all the countries that we have in this world. And also it keeps all the cities that are located in these countries. And also there is the table country language that basically records uh, what languages people speak who live in, let's say, country A or country B. And what will happen with the partitioning? Let's say right now I want to deploy the schema in my distributed in-memory database, such as Apache Ignite or anything else. And what I, as, an, as a developer or, or architect, uh, architect uh, need to do? First of all, I just need to create table and I can use standard SQL operation for that. Here is I'm creating table country. Uh, that's what I do. And what happens internally? Internally, the partitioning algorithm will create this table and split this table into a fixed number of partitions. There will be partition one, two, like three, four, like up to some maximum number. For instance, in Ignite, the maximum in default number of partitions is 1024. Once this partitioning, once this, once this step is completed, all those partitions will be spread across uh, the current cluster. So some of the partitions will be assigned to node one, the other partitions will be assigned to the other node. The goal of this partitioning alg algorithm is not only to split the the, uh, your table into partitions, but also then assign all those partitions evenly across your existing cluster. And the next obvious step, once we created uh, such such table, and once that table was partitioned for us, we as application developers uh, would insert the very first record there. And again, here is what we are doing. We just executing this insert into country command. And then internally what happens, the partitioning algorithm will take the primary key of uh, your record, will map this primary key to a partition number using special hash function. And after that, once the partition is found, uh, your application will connect to one of the cluster nodes and will put this record into like into the node that stores the primary copy of this partition. So if to take this record into, as an example, we are inserting the value for the United States. Let's assume that we know that code is the primary key. And let's assume that this primary key was mapped to partition number five. And this partition right now is located on node, on the third node. And that's why that record will be placed there. Again, what's our responsibility here? We are just executing this insert statement command in our distributed in memory platform or cache database, basically maps this record to a partition and then puts this uh, record on a node that owns the primary copy of this partition. It's all easy, right? Uh, now, let me, before we are diving into the second essential capability of distributed and memory systems, let me show you how this partitioning uh, works in practice. 
So what I've prepared so far. Uh, I'm going to start a distributed Ignite cluster on my local machine. I'm using one of the latest versions of Apache Ignite. All right, so uh, I'm starting it right now. The first node is ready, so I have only one server node. A server node is basically uh, our container for data. So that's actually a group of server nodes define and form a distributed cluster. That's my first server node. And let me start another node because at least I want to have two, two node cluster. All right, wonderful. So right now I've got this cluster. Uh, and let me see, I also, I'm going to use this management console that is available for Ignite deployments. If I'm going to the monitoring dashboard, uh, I should be able to connect to my locally running cluster. This uh, version of the tool is running somewhere uh, in the cloud. But what I see here, yes, here's a, I've got two nodes cluster. I don't have any data. I don't. I have not created any caches or tables. It's just just empty cluster that stays idle. And then the next, uh, as long as we have just you know talked about partitioning, uh, let me uh, load some data into this cluster, especially that world database, and then we can see how the data was distributed for us. I'm going to connect to the cluster using this command. I'm going to use SQL line tool and uh, ignite JDBC driver. That's my cluster. So let me connect to it. All right. It says that we are connected. If I execute tables command, I don't see any, I don't have any tables for now. And next, let me load this script. I'll show you its content while the script is being loaded. So the script is as follows. So generally we are creating that country table that I've already mentioned. We are creating city table, others. And then basically we are inserting all these records, just standard loading procedure. All right, the table is loaded. If I execute tables command again, I've got them here. And if I'm jumping back to the monitoring tool, Yep, I can see them here under the caches. It, it might sound confusing for you, but generally in Ignite cache and tables term, I use like they are the same. I mean, you usually use caches if you are using key value APIs and you use tables if you're running SQL queries. But anyway, I've created these tables. There are some records. And the next step is partitioning, how the data was partitioned. To do that, uh, let me see the partitioning distribution for the city table. I'm clicking on partitions. And that's what we've got. 514 partitions allocated on one node and the rest is placed on the other node. So if you want to see how many keys or records allocated in every partition, you can use this table down below. Let me sort it by the partition number. So like we have three records in partition zero, four records in partition three, etc. So generally all this magic happened internally. This is how it works in Ignite. And this is basically how it will be supported and working in any other distributed memory system. And why should you know, why should be you aware about this partitioning? So generally your goal, the partitioning is kind of something that is supported internally. And your goal is just basically, you know, to uh, be aware that Initially, you can have just two, two nodes cluster, and then whenever you want to scale out, just add new nodes. And your distributed in memory system, such as Apache Ignite, will kind of redistribute these partitions, and you will be able to utilize much more memory and uh, many more CPUs. All right. Having said that, let's move on with the second essential capability of uh, distributed in memory systems. Because, uh, you know, partitioning does a lot of hard work by distributing our records and the, the partitioning algorithms are trying to do this similarly. But also there are some of the occasions when a distributed system such as Apache Ignite need your help to, to, to kind of to help your help, you know, to distribute the records uh, more naturally, if you put it this way. So let's take this example. What happens with the default partitioning uh, algorithm? 
uh, in this example, I have two tables. I have country table and city table. You can see that uh, Canada and France, like the records of Canada and France are allocated on two different nodes. And when it comes to the city table, also all those cities are distributed randomly. And there is, we can, um, we might end up having one, one problem. So it might happen that some Canadian cities, such as Montreal or Ottawa, they're highlighted in yellow. They are located on a different node. They are not stored together with all these Canadian cities. And the same is true about uh, French cities. Paris is not stored together on the same machine where we have the primary record of France. And this default distribution might be not a big deal for you, especially if you're not using any complex queries. But if it happens that you need to execute any complex queries, such as SQL with joins, then you need to, to do something about this distribution. For instance, what happens in this example? Let's say that all the cities um, were distributed randomly. We were not involved in the data distribution. And when I'm executing this SQL query, uh, which returns uh, the most populated cities across uh, Canada and France, the following would happen. Our application will connect to the cluster. It will send this query to those two nodes and then during the join phase, uh, Paris, Ottawa, and Montreal will be shuffled between those between those nodes because the first node need all the Canadian cities to complete its join phase, and the second node needs all the French cities to complete its join phase. And this data shuffling thing can be really problematic for distributed in memory systems because in this example we are shuffling just three records. But usually in the real world, you would be kind of joining thousands, if not millions of records, uh, which can provoke uh, the data shuffling of, let's say, like hundreds of thousands of other records. And the network is extremely slow. And uh, basically how slow network uh, the network is. Let's go back to the same uh, uh, table we used at the beginning of our conversation. So that time I pointed out that memory is much faster than disk but disk is much faster than network. That's why, let's say, if it happens that you distribute it like fancy and speedy in memory system, uh, kind of execute some of the operation that shuffle a lot, large data sets across the network, you can diminish or kill all the in-memory benefits of your system because network is extremely slow. And how can we fix this situation? Because in this case, it's natural. We know the relation between countries and cities. And somehow I want to ensure that my cluster, my distributed in memory system will keep all the related uh, cities on the same machine. So I want to achieve this distribution, like you see on the screen. And all we need to do as application developers is to do one little change. Uh, let's take a look at it. So we have this country table that we, it's, it's all simple. We just need to have the primary key, which is the code. But when it comes to the city table, we need to do a little modification, a small modification. So in addition to the primary key, which will be uh, a compound primary key, which consists of the ID and country code values, I'm going to introduce the affinity key, which is equal to the country code. And the goal of the affinity key is to help our partitioning algorithm to decide where to place all the cities. So when you will be, the next time when you will be inserting all these records, cities, in the cluster, the partitioning algorithm will be the value of the affinity key to decide uh, to put your uh, city. And it's not surprising that all the cities in the same country have the same value of the country code. And as a result, the partitioning algorithm will group together and place together all those cities on the same machine. That's what we want to achieve. Okay. Once you do this, once uh, and once you execute the same query over uh, this data set, you will no longer have any data shuffling phase because when those two nodes will be performing the joining join phase, uh, joining table and country tables, all the data will be local for them. And there is no any, any need to shuffle anything. And this way, the performance will be truly dramatic. And as a result, once you apply and once you uh, take advantage of this affinity allocation concept, uh, you will be able to kind of use all the resources of your cluster and you will be able to run really fast SQL queries or any other complex operations, okay?
So right now, let's uh, kind of check another demo. I'm going to use uh, the same Apache Ignite cluster uh, that I've started earlier. I have two node cluster. But the next thing, I want to reload this table. Now, let, let me do this. Let me first connect. Let me first show you some of the queries. I prepared some of the queries for this uh, specific world schema. So the very first query, let's use it just to double check that everything works as expected. I'm going to return the most populated countries in the world, China, India, and the United States uh, are the ranked first. Oh, sorry, my kid is my kid is trying to meddle in. Uh, and, and next, the second query is, uh, that's the query that we explored from the slides. Here is I want to uh, get the most populated cities, not only across the United States and France, but across all these countries. And this query involves the join phase. Okay, so there is some exception. Probably there is there was some issue with this tool. Yeah, it's fixed. So generally, if I execute this query, this is supposed to be a correct result set, like Seoul, San Paulo, and Mexico City. But in fact, that's not the correct result set because I know that the data is not stored together. It's not collocated. If I want to see correct result set, I need to allow Apache Ignite cluster, the Apache Ignite cluster to do the data shuffling between the nodes during the join phase. And I do this by enabling this option, allow non-collocated joins. It can sound, it can sound odd, but that's how, how it's named right now. And right now, if I execute the same query, first of all, it took much more time for me to complete it, but at least right now I see the correct answer. Seoul, St. Paul, and Shanghai are the most populated cities across those countries. And usually on average, it takes me like one, one second or two seconds to complete this operation. Now let's fix that this happens, like this performance is so poor because uh, I'm shuffling the data between the nodes, but I know that I can easily fix it. I'm going to open this schema. I've let me find this city table. And here is I have primary key. I see I'll already see that ID and country code uh, comprise my primary key. Uh, but at the same time, I don't have affinity key, the affinity key yet. Let me define it. Affinity key. And I want the affinity key to be equal to country code. Once I do this, then all the records of the cities that have the same value of the country code will be placed and grouped together on the same node. That's my goal. That's what I want to achieve. All right. And right now, let me execute this script. Uh, the name is different. I'm restarting. I, I dropped the tables. I am reloading these tables because I changed the data distribution. And But right now, if I go back to the screen, so first of all, remember that Seoul, St. Paul, and Shanghai are the most populated cities. That's the correct answer. I no longer this data shuffling. I no longer need this data shuffling option, so I'm uh, removing it. Just in case, let me refresh this browser screen. SQL. And right now, if I execute the same query, you can see that it takes me not seconds, but like like 40 milliseconds, so like like just milliseconds range to get the same result set, Seoul, St. Paul, and Shanghai. And what I've done, I just, you know, collocated the data using the knowledge about the data relation. That's it. And that's actually how, how you need to approach all those distributed and memory systems. Because by definition, they're designed to keep your data across a cluster of machines in memory, and that promises a lot. But we also have to be involved. And that's why the second, that essential capability, which is affinity collocation or data grouping, have to be in your toolbox because you, no, no, only you know your kind of domain logic uh, and you need to help the partitioning algorithm to distribute your records properly. And once you collocate the records, then you can run any complex operation, let it be joints, let it be any other compute uh, tasks. And that's how we are coming to the final topic, uh, collocated computations. 
So with the previous example, uh, we've seen that we helped to speed up our SQL operations that uh, use joins. But at the same time, you might deal with some complex business operations, which are multi-step operations. What I mean here, let's say that you're trying to uh, do, you, you like I, I can see here is I can speak about one, one real use case. One of the well-known banks, uh, they store millions and millions of savings account in a distributed in memory cluster. And then once a month, uh, they need to perform one kind of financial operation. They need to traverse all those uh, savings accounts, do some checks, do some calculations, and then apply an interest rate for every account and write down all those changes back to the Ignite cluster. Uh, so generally that operation involves many kinds of round trips like SQL, key value, transactions, etc. And uh, historically, before that company moved to Ignite, uh, they used uh, Oracle database or like any other relational database. And they would run this operation once, once a month, late night, when the load on the system was minimal. And with Oracle database, what happened? There was a special application. That application would connect to the database. It would read all those million savings accounts uh, to the application side and would do some calculations, uh, some financial checks, apply the interest rate, and then write back everything to Oracle. It took that company, you know, like more than two hours to complete this uh, operation over like like one like one petabyte data set. When they moved to Apache Ignite, they deployed everything in distributed in memory cluster. And what they've changed after that, they just kind of, instead of using Oracle operation, they started using Ignite SQL queries. Yes, they could speed up the calculation, let's say from two hours to one, one hour, 30 minutes, like with Ignite. So there was a, some change, but it was not dramatic. There, that was not a breakthrough. And then we decided you know, to do one change. We decided to take this logic and send uh, that logic for the execution to the cluster machines so that we don't need to move all those millions of accounts from the cluster to the application. And once they did this, uh, the performance like kind of spiked dramatically. It took them like 10 or 15 minutes to complete this operation. And before that operation was executed, like it, it took them, it was taking them like two hours to complete it with a relational database. And here is we are talking not about, that was not the problem of the database, Oracle database. That was the problem of the network because with the relational database, they were transferring all the data back and forth between the application and, and Oracle. While with Ignite, they don't need to transfer. They just can create their custom logic written in Java or .NET and execute it. And that's, uh, that's we all know those APIs. Uh, those are MapReduce like APIs. Hadoop historically supported them. It has MapReduce engine. In memory, in many memory distributed systems such as Apache Ignite or any other databases, they also so give you an ability to create to execute your custom tasks written on Java or .NET, let's say, on your cluster. So the logic is simple. Let's say you're creating uh, a calculation that reads all the savings accounts, and uh, uh, then does some calculations and applies that interest rate. That's the example I used. Then you, you created this uh, calculation, then you send this calculation for the execution to your cluster. Then the second step, all this logic gets executed on your cluster machine. Hopefully no, no single bit of data uh, will be moved back and forth between uh, the server nodes or your application, and that's it. And then in the end, your application will get probably some, you know, tiny, small result set, and that's it. That's like you eliminated that heavy network usage with your compute tasks, and you're good to go. As a summary, uh, in memory computing essentials, today my goal was, you know, briefly to introduce you to the three essential capabilities that define, I would say, almost all the memory computing systems, not only Apache Ignite. The first one is data partitioning. That's a crucial algorithm that will help you to utilize all the resources of your cluster, let it be memory, disk, or CPUs. The partitioning takes care of the data distribution. You just have to be aware of how the partitioning works and how it can uh, help you with your kind of scalability goals. Second, uh, essential feature of distributed and memory systems, which usually exists in uh, databases that support SQL at least. And here is, I can give you an example, like MemSQL, VolDB, uh, like Google Spanner, all of those also support like affinity collocation thing. With affinity collocation, you can help your partitioning algorithm to store some data sets properly together. 
And remember this example with cities and countries. Cities have one common characteristic that they exist and are located in one in, in one specific country. And that's why if you apply this affinity allocation in practice, you will be able to run complex calculations of your data sets, avoiding uh, network usage. And with allocated computations, that's the final and probably one of the uh, most tremendous uh, features in your toolbox. With this, you can basically write any custom logic. Let's say if you're talking about Java, you can use any features of JDK or any other third-party frameworks. And you can create some complex Java calculation uh, and execute all that logic on your cluster nodes, avoiding any data movement between your uh, machines. So generally, by knowing this in memory computing essentials, yes, you, you, you know how like all those distributed capabilities are exploited, but also your goal as of an architect or developer, you need to ensure that network is not utilized heavily. And that's, yeah, that's like a wonderful summer because I, I, as I said, I've been working with distributed and memory systems for a while. And one of the common problem that I see over the time is that a lot of the companies, they do a great job by selling in memory computing technologies. But then once we start, you know, coding or architecting, only then we figure out that the life is not the simple and that it's not just enough, you know, to put data in memory, close the cluster of machines and achieve nirvana. In fact, yes, you need to keep in mind that you need to uh, work with your data partitioning algorithm, you need to use affinity allocation, and also never neglect uh, the power of allocated computations. If you want to learn more, so uh, my suggestion would be uh, all those distributed memory systems, they share a lot of the characteristics with other disk-based distributed systems. So if you want to dig deeper and learn more, just check out these books, Designing Data Intensive Application or Database Internals. Uh, Ignite also like kind of, you will find something that uh, defines Ignite as well in those books. And if you're interested about the distributed and memory systems, you can always uh, come to our website, learn how Ignite is designed, how Ignite works, etc. And feel free to contribute. All right, uh, and now we are ready. We have five minutes left, like four minutes and 30 seconds. And let me check uh, the questions. I see that we've got several. Uh, the first one from Mark Andre. Can the affinity key be added without dropping the table and recreating it? Uh, unfortunately not. It's like, uh, you, you know, like, let's take this example. We all know what uh, the hash tables are or hash maps. Hash table basically internally how the hash table is designed. It it maps every key to one of the buckets of this hash table. And the, what changes over the time, your this uh, the mapping like the hash code function that maps your key to a bucket of the hash table. Uh, must never change. Otherwise, like you can let's say if one time this hash function returns. Uh, maps uh, your key to one bucket, uh, but when you execute this hash function once again, it will map it to the other bucket, it will be kind of an overkill. And the same situation applies to distributed memory systems. This uh, key to partition mapping always have to be consistent as long as your uh, cluster is running. So, and here is what I've changed with the city tables. I generally changed the way the partitioning algorithm uh, needs to distribute uh, my cities. So before all those cities, before the partitioning algorithm, let me show you on this example. Before, before I added this call, uh, par parameter, let me remove it. When I had this stuff, actually the partition algorithm was calculating the hash code based on this combination. Actually, it was using the value of ID and country code to find out what's the partition number. And then when I've added, uh, when I've added this affinity key, property, I generally influence the way the partition algorithm calculates uh, all those hash codes that map your key to the partition number. So that's why I had to reload this table. So in generally, uh, you, probably some of the guys, uh, usually you can, usually you don't have this problem in production because you, you design all this way ahead before you go, you deploy the very first production option. Uh, and that's why we are talking about this affinity allocation right now because that's something that you have to keep in mind initially and not like i'm i'm already in production and i forgot i forgot to you know define this affinity key 
hope that my, my, my answer makes sense to you, Mark. And the other question is, so uh, so you query Ignite instead of the database uh, directly, is it right? Yes, so in this case, uh, Ignite is my database. Ignite, right now, Ignite is my memory database. So I have this, uh, let me show. Ignite is my, I have this two node Ignite cluster. They're running on my local laptop. Then you can go ahead and deploy them whenever you like. And here is, I connect it to, to this Ignite cluster. You can see this line. I'm using the JDBC driver of Ignite. I connect it to this local cluster running here. And uh, all the SQL queries that I demonstrated to you, uh, this tool, GridGain Web Console, that's one of the legacy tools that is being replaced right now. But anyway, this tool also is connected to, let me show you. This tool is connected to this, my local cluster. Here are my two cluster nodes. These are the tables, et cetera, that I created in Ignite, that's it. And all those operations were executed by Ignite. So right here is we have only Ignite, but all the data is in memory right now. All right, folks, any other questions? I think that, yes, I think that uh, we uh, fit in time. So thanks for attending. If you have any other questions, you can find me on their Apache Ignite user list or dev list, or you can always uh, kind of pin me on Twitter. Thanks for coming and enjoy the rest of the conference. Good luck.